You are now listening to the Going North Podcast, where you'll receive tips and techniques to advance yourself. I'm your host, Dom Brightman, and every week we're going to be hearing from an author who's going to share their expertise to help you charge forward in life. On a quick side note, be sure to check out Going North, the book. It's available in ebook, audio, as well as paperback form for those who love to read a traditional book. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Going North podcast, we're back at you again with another author in the making, baby. That's right, baby. When you got two hands, you got to use one of them to write. And if you're ambidextrous, use both of them to write. And through the power of Toastmasters, I met one of the wonderful guests for today's show, and this guy right here. This guy's been anticipating the technological singularity since starting the Harvard College Future Society back in 2009. So my man's been doing some big things over the past decade, baby. That's right. And apparently he also graduated high school as a valedictorian with a degree in economics as well as the Maharishi University of Management for Sustainable Business. This guy's got a big, big plan ahead, baby. He's going to be taking over the world, metaphorically speaking, to help folks find more peace and prosperity. And you're probably wondering who this wonderful guy right here is who has got one heck of a bright head in the shoulders. It's the one, the only, father, futurist, and yogi, Kevin Jane. How are you today, sir? Well, it's another day to get great to be alive, and I'm um, grateful to be young and, and healthy. Good thing. And, uh, yep, writing, writing these days does take two hands. It's ambidextrous with the keyboard. Learning to touch type was a, a miraculous thing and can type out pretty fast nowadays. Oh, yeah, that's the futurism right there, baby. That's right. Forget the pen and paper, man. Use that top of the lap or even a smartphone if you have to. That's right. Mm-hmm. Most certainly. Until telep- telepathy is here and it's, it's uh, normal to just uh, communicate thoughts without words. <laughs> I guess that was the way kind of like body language, right? <laughs> yeah. That's about 90% of communication, actually. Our cells communicate with other cells in the, in the physical world much more rapidly than vibrations and frequencies and words. That's uh, far more interesting in terms of communication styles. Heck yeah, man. Because we all know words can be many, but sometimes we're behind the words that count. Oh, yes, they. So just gave a short little introduction to the wonderful world of Mr. KJ himself. Uh, mind filling in some gaps I may have missed? Sure, I think you hit it all. I mean, the futurist father and yogi is really how I define myself. The futurism has been a part of my life since uh, about 2009. I spent a lot of time at Harvard where I went to college thinking about human rationality and logic and, and science and a lot of that and transhumanism and hosted the Harvard College Future Society Conference where Ray Kurzweil, Stephen Wolfram, people came and we spoke about the future of technology, where it's taking us as a society, as a species, as a culture, and what that really means for the human race. And that led to really, really spiritual questions and philosophical questions opening up to what are the limits of, of human cognition and reasoning? Because at some point, faith takes over and love takes over and, and the mind is under subject to the influence of love and spirituality, which led to six, eight years traveling, learning about seven or eight different types of meditation, 10 days of silence at multiple times, just to India, and it's been very enlightening in many ways. And then I became a father when I met a, uh, my lovely wife at Maharishi University of Management, and being a father has been a whole other journey in itself. That is, it's truly human and, and fun in so many ways. And that's in my path now, and I'm coming out with a bo- couple books to help people along their path. Um, 20-something-year-olds are my favorite, and they still got the hunger and love inside of them and the idealism. And channeling that through the power of meditation, as well as putting forth a vision for humanity uh, for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years as we evolve out of the chaos and we move into the light. Oh, yeah, man, that's right. 
Sounds like some big plans, man. Big plans indeed, and also fatherhood indeed. <laughs> Got a little one. Just wait until the teenage years show up, right? <laughs> I'm looking forward to them. Oh, yeah, that's right. Going to be a house full of geniuses, baby. If not already. <laughs> Everyone has their own genius. Just a matter of sh- letting it shine in the right way. That's what I believe. Genius is simply aligned spiritual energy and focused. And when people are truly in an environment where they can flourish, that it's infectious, the, the, the genius. And I believe each person is a genius, truly. Amen, indeed. Amen, indeed. Shout out to good buddy Maisha Collins, who also likes to say that genius is common. So you, you heard it here, folks. My man Kevin has just freaking proved it once again, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Well, all righty, man. So with all of that wonderful stuff at such a young age, what really just inspired you to really – able to really go to Harvard and to be able to be in the room with all these scientists and actually transform that into what you're doing now? Well, the belief that more is possible has always been a driving influence. I, I believe truly that there's going to be a day when there's no hunger on the planet, when everyone has enough food, water, shelter, that there's no poverty, that everyone is, the diseases are cured. I do believe in an idealistic future, and I do believe that we can achieve those goals as a society and that the entire model of economics in terms of scarcity is really one of abundance. And I think we'll see a big revolution in technology, spirituality, economics. We're going to see a, a large transformation in our, in our lifetime. And that undying faith is what drives me through all time, good, bad, light and dark, through, through hell and back to, to really – shape the human species future and in a what could be perceived as a hard universe but i think there's so much light and love as well that it it fuels and drives me to this future state that i can feel that it's going to manifest yeah beautiful indeed beautiful indeed so a bright future awaits that's something that all folks like to hear or at least most folks like to hear about it Mm mm-hmm Yep. It's uh, important, especially in, in our world today, of kind of that, that to believe that world peace is possible. And it's simply a, a condition in the nervous system of, of a calm brain and a relaxed mind and, and a desire for the human species to really be calm. It, it's possible and it's, it's happening. And I think our species is evolving really beautifully and lovely in a way into a more evolved and more majestic and magical state. I do think that that's happening. I do think that that's evolving faster. And I think that as technology and media and these forces combine, combined with a thoughtful, slow approach to, to the world, that we can all become who we, at a, our deepest hearts, want to be. And uh, that's where I'm writing in this book, uh, my Unifying Humanity book, about this vision of the future, about what it will actually take to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, how we can actually end poverty, end hunger, and build water for everybody on the planet. 893 million people don't have water today. There's, there's ways we do that. And I talk about the economics of that, the, how engaging corporations can actually be a tool for that, how the political process and, and states and citizens can all come together and make that happen. Yeah, that's something we do need to make happen nowadays, especially since it's basically 2019 and there's so much technology available nowadays where folks can actually possibly get access to it so that way they can hopefully have clean running water because that's, that's a lot of people without clean running water or at least clean water, man. That That's something that we have to change. So it's good that you're focusing on that. So what inspired the title, man, Unifying Humanity, is because of all the humans on the planet and all the way that we're just advancing in technology despite some of the negativity that's out there. What inspired the title? So thank you. So back in, um, I think when I was 12 or 13 even, something something a while ago, uh, I came up with the title. I was writing in my room and I was writing in a journal and I was prolific 
in terms of writing about what I was thinking or feeling, drawing diagrams. And the title kind of grew then as, as a, a clause, Unifying Humanity. It's a description of what I felt I was doing at the time. And the title stuck, in my own mind anyway. And then I, it just, it, it's morphed and it's grown and it's evolved all throughout my college and high school years and post-college careers and my professional career. It's been this, this verb that I describe in my heart as what I'm doing. It's really stuck. And it's a really heart-focused title that it's the love that unites us and that the mind, when anchored by the heart, is actually more powerful than, than otherwise. So that, that's where the title really came from. And it's it stuck. That's great indeed. And there's some barriers out there that may exist in some parts of the world. What, what do you think that we should probably do in terms of like maybe in terms of like action steps to actually help try to break down those barriers so we can actually unify humanity in a way and come more close together? Mm-hmm. Well, separateness is illusory at a much more spiritual level. Separateness is illusory. There is no separation. Barriers are all mind created and, and just illusory. In terms of, so at that, at that metaphysical level, that's an, that's an important truth to know. And a lot of that is simply in, in our person to personal interactions, it's being more authentic and open, removes any distance between our hearts in a way that allows for a more open communication. I think also the, the focusing on what your own heart desires allows you to remove the clutter of other people's opinions, other people's, even what's happening in the news, and, and just you let all of that fall away, and then your heart, following your heart and its, its enmeshment and intuition will clarify the answer to that question for everyone, because for everyone it's different, and the answer is simply in your heart. I think that's the most important thing I would tell anyone really, especially in the teenage years who are struggling with, at this point, short attention spans and all kinds of issues with this overabundance of technology that there's more, the more mind, the more heart energy that can balance out the mind energy, the better. That decrease in the mind energy and increase in the heart energy is what really encourages barriers to fall, boundaries to fall and to, to unite as a species. And that's an individual responsibility first and foremost, that any future world changer should really take to heart. Uh, so that makes sense in a way. So basically start at home with the heart within and yourself before trying to, I guess, help the world in a way. <laughs> Just make sure you focus more on having a heartfelt connection with one another and then try to branch out that way as opposed to trying to fix everything in the physical realm. Mm-hmm. Starts in the mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a, as a, as we are in our minds and our hearts, so are we in manifesting in the real world. It's very it's very straightforward. That's right, arrow straight, baby, arrow straight indeed. And speaking of as a man thinketh, I'm pretty sure there've been a few books that have really added on to your expertise. My sharing a title or two that has really inspired you. Sure. That's definitely one. I've actually listened to that book every day for the last uh, about 12 days. I just put a CD in my car and I just listen to it as I go. So it's not just guiding my feet, it's guiding my car as well. That's, that's the, the philosophy there. The, there's been several. Think and Grow Rich has been one that I've enjoyed quite a few times. That one's been, been very nice as well. Those are the two that I've, I've really kind of loved the most recently. Also, Principles by Ray Dalio has been, been a good one. I uh, used to work at Bridgewater, and that's a, that's a really good understanding of how the, the global economy works and a very simple way of thinking about how, how things work. So I really recommend that one, too. There's also some really cool articles on art of manliness. Uh, one is Don't Waste Your 20s, Taking Advantage of the Unique Powers of the Brain, the 20-something Brain, which really has motivated me to, to be more focused and creative in my 20s, which has been important as well. I highly recommend that article to anyone, any, certainly, certainly young men in their 20s. Amen to that nowadays, man. you got to take advantage as much as you can while you can. It's 
especially when they're 20s, that's a decade that no one ever gets to see again. They only get to see it once, <laughs> as with life, too, or at least in this form, anyway. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Great list of books, indeed. Great list of books, indeed. And you work for Bridgewater, too. That's freaking awesome, dude. Mm-hmm. It's been a good play. Learned a lot there. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. So how was that experience, man? I, and especially at a young age, too, because you were able to get that there in your 20s, I, I imagine. Yep, yep. Certainly there at a young age. It was really uh, it was really powerful. I learned a lot. I loved the culture. Uh, I loved everything about it, honestly. And the only reason I left was I went to, then I actually went to the Maharishi University of Management to learn Transcendental Meditation in depth, which is the spiritual practice of the, that largely practiced within the organization. Spent a lot of time learning Transcendental Meditation and went on a spiritual path as well that kind of turned my economics into, and meditation together and brought them together in a way that I really enjoyed. The, 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 really that way of thinking and the non-hierarchical structure is how the world is going to evolve into. I think everyone's going to be able to be the master of his or her own self as we move forward in society, and enlightenment is going to become normal, and that, that peace is going to become uh, assumed and normal. And that's, that's really what I believe. I don't, know, that I don't know what that has to do with Bridgewater, actually. Bridgewater was great in terms of a hedge fund. It was, it was a fantastic place to be. That's just where I went with things. That's why I left. And I think there's a, a pro-social mission that I feel that a hedge fund is great and the, the tools and techniques are there. And taking that energy and turning it into a pro-social movement, a pro-social uh, project is really where, what I felt called to do. And I still feel called to do. And that's what we're going to see in my upcoming books. And what I tell the people that I coach and the clients that I teach are, in terms of how to really cultivate your heart's intuition and find your own path in a way that serves humanity, in a way that's fulfilling both inside and out. Uh, sounds great indeed. Sounds great indeed inside and out. And, and it's really great that you focus not only on just the physical with the Bridgewater and also just going to the university and actually learning transcendental meditation. So I'll explain what that is for those who may not be familiar with that. Sure, yes. Transcendental meditation is basically a, a simple mantra-based meditation. And what that means is basically you are given a mantra and taught the, the technique uh, in over four days, two hours each day. And it, it takes the, the mind and it simply takes it down to the root level. And when you when I do med transcendental meditation, I experience this inner silence and inner calm and inner quiet that's uh, really the, it's hard to explain, but it's actually easy to explain. It's basically alpha waves that, that create an alpha coherence in the neocortex that allow for a silence that, especially in the young 20 brain, it helps manage emotions and create this emotional calm that, that, that you can think clearly and rationally and achieve a higher state of evolution. It's a technique that was really popular in the 60s and 70s. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, he taught the Beatles and, all, and a bunch of celebrities really today that really still practice it, as well as 6 million people worldwide. It's a, it's a lovely technique, and it's only 20 minutes twice a day, which has been really convenient and simple way to stay regular and grow in consciousness. Uh, you're right, because I think I remember listening to Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography, and he mentioned transcendental meditation during his time when he first came to the U.S., so that that's really awesome right there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a wonderful practice. I highly recommend it. I'm happy to, to point people in the right direction or ask, answer more questions about it. It's one of my favorite subjects to speak about. That's right, because in addition to the Wonderful main book, Unifying Humanity. I believe later this year in April you got a book called 12 Weeks to Meditation, right? Yep, 12 Weeks to Wellness, and it includes meditation paths. Uh, so what, what really inspired this book is I loved working out for a long time. There was a time when I couldn't work out, and then all of a sudden I just got into this routine, and it completely changed my life. Just by going to the gym for an hour each day, I could just win the day and, and develop a sense of momentum and clarity and purpose in my life. And I found that a meditation also helped, like, helped with that. 
And I've noticed so many people come up to me and ask me how to meditate, what, what should I do to start meditating, oh, I can't focus, what app should I use, and things like that. And I realized that there wasn't really a strong guide to meditating in today's day and age that you could follow just like working out. And so I set, set out to create it, and that's what I'm working on now. It's a step-by-step guide on how to actually meditate and how to actually improve your concentration, de-stress, and become happier in life. And it's, it's been a really fun project to do, and I'm looking forward to publishing it and working with people to actually help them, to coach people through this process and to, to publish a book on it. It's, it's pretty exciting. That's right, exciting indeed, and it's great that you're doing that because meditation is becoming a lot more popular nowadays and folks are trying to become more mindful, and of course wellness is a huge thing. Folks want to live longer and be healthier, and especially with finding ways to meditate because funny enough, I was talking with one of my colleagues a few months ago and mentioned I should probably at least try to start with at least a good five minutes. She's like, I can't do that. I think of too many things to do. Oh, man. So it's like, yep, folks are going to need that. Most certainly. It's, it's, uh, it's really more than, even more than, than coaching people. It's, when people can access that spiritual calm, it's, it's priceless. And it's, it's really positive. And I love coaching people on meditation and, and helping people wrestle through issues, especially finding self-identity in a world of, of so many competing opinions and desires and philosophies, really guiding people such that the inside comes out, which is really the whole point of meditation, having some kind of externalized program to follow. It's got to be designed to bring the inside out and allow for the fullest expression of the self, which is what I'm doing in this book. That's right, helping out the masses, baby, helping out the masses. What any advice for those who are right now writing their books and looking to publish them as well because there's a lot of folks out there who are being told, like, hey, you should write a book, you should write a book, but a lot of folks, they, they may get started, but they never finished. Any advice for those looking to finish as you're on track to finishing your first book? Yeah, make, making sure that you actually care about it, making sure that it's actually something that almost writes itself in your sleep. As you're sleeping, it's all, all that you think about, all that you're, you're doing, all that, that matters to you. And if, if it's such so all-consuming like that, and it has to be written, it'll be written. Otherwise, wait a couple of years, and it'll, it'll come in a better season. That's what I'd say. Uh, so don't rush the seasons of life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly it. And you also mentioned that you're a coach, so I'm guessing coaching is also a part of all that is Kevin Jane? Yes. Yes, it is. I teach people on mindfulness, meditation, wellness, achieving goals. I even do New Year's resolutions coaching for people who actually want to set and achieve long-term goals, and it's, it's been both rewarding for myself as well as my clients. And it's, uh, it's really a fun relationship on both sides. People, we both grow. And I think that it's been helpful for people who are navigating worlds of, of economics, finances, meditation, wellness, health, family, and, and all of these issues, as well as wanting to change the world in a way that's positive. I've got a lot of experience wrestling with those issues, and the deeply philosophical ones as well, and, uh, and really establishing a foundation of integrity to help become whole, which is what integrity means. And that comes through discipline and putting people on a path and keeping people accountable and also making sure the heart's bought in really is a passion of mine. That's right, a passionate, disciplined mind. That's right, the mind you need to succeed. That's what I'm talking about. Yep. Yep, you're dumb. You, you got it in, uh, in your book as well. I think you, you have many of the same principles and were aligned closely with with those uh, with those principles. Oh yeah, that's right. Got to get them while they're young. Get them the good stuff. Heck, even get them wherever they are. Actually, <laughs> doesn't matter the age. 
Yeah. Well, beautiful indeed, beautiful indeed. Well, all righty, coming down the pike here, and a question I'd like to ask every guest, and, well, you probably don't have to go too far for this one, and that is if you were to wake up tomorrow and you were 25 in the current year of 2019, but you get to keep all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Meditate. There we go. That's the meditation part right there. <laughs> beautiful indeed. Beautiful indeed. Oh, all righty. For those who want to keep in contact with you, what's the best way to keep in touch with you and be updated about when your book is released and all that good stuff? Sure. You can go to web, my website at uh, www.kevinjane.com. I don't do social media. I don't do Twitter. I don't do Instagram. I don't do any of that. I just have a website, kevinjane.com. And I'm happy to uh, – you can email me at kevin at kevinjane.com, and I'll answer personally. All right. Beautiful indeed. Beautiful indeed. Well, all right. We'll be sure to put all that good stuff in the show notes to kevinjane.com. Goodness. So any parting words for those still listening? Well, hope hope your day is in love, life, and harmony, and and make sure you smile. That's really important. It's it's so it it makes the whole world better, and you'll find you're, you're happier as well. How's it going, you super special, awesome human? Since you made it to the end of this episode, it looks like you really enjoyed yourself. Since you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with at least three people in your network and tell them what you really liked about this episode. Heck, even shoot myself or the guest an email and let them know what you liked most about this interview so that way they can stay inspired to keep pushing out great work. 